There are many shows dedicated to Magic the Gathering strategies, decks, and formats. But unlike all of them, this channel is about discussing an individual card, an isolated card, an unrelated card. This is an Magic Card. Once again, I emerge from the digital shadows, a drawing of a picture of a dusty cupboard, which represents a human being who goes by the hastily conceived moniker of dusty cupboards while exhaustively discussing randomly selected magic cards on the unfortunately named YouTube TV show and magic card. I am them. This is that. Now is now. And I am glad that you are joining me in this very foolish venture. The last episode, episode number 13, was terribly cursed. And despite having made essentially the same video 12 times prior with a fairly set formula, I somehow managed to entirely forget the set symbol, release date, and code name, which accompanied the Revenant Reverend we previously discussed. Fortunately for me, and really for all of human civilization, there exists a special group of people who safeguard us from factual incongruities and overlooked details. These legendary heroes are my YouTube commenters. These kind-hearted super geniuses create a safety net into which my rustic wooden form can harmlessly flop after each video release, and to thank them and highlight their contributions, I review their commentary in a segment which I like to call looking at some of the YouTube comments from the last video with our eyeballs. YouTube user Utstash pointed out in a pinworthy post that my previous video inaccurately identified several pieces by magic artist Jean-Sebastien Rosbach as being early works by Seb McKinnon, which I used to help demonstrate how Seb's work has become more stylized over time. The fact that these paintings weren't done by Seb at all would make that argument slightly less valid. I will say that, thankfully, I think the overall trend within his portfolio is still present, but that he actually started much closer to where he ended up. Jean-Sebastien and Rosebach's name includes the name Seb, which is why I made this mistake. Rewatching this portion of my last video with the knowledge that I misattributed the pieces is actually pretty humorous. That many of his early illustrations are probably completely unassociated with him. I personally had no idea that he was the artist for Relic of Progenitus. And you can easily see the name of the artist on the card right there at the bottom. This is easily the biggest blunder I've ever committed on this channel, and I would like to personally apologize to both artists in addition to everybody else who has ever lived. David Curtinson bemoaned that YouTube didn't tell them about my new episode when I uploaded it. And this is something I can relate to. YouTube is constantly trying to get me to rewatch videos I've already seen, or Japanese funk albums from the 70s for some reason, while choosing not to show me videos that I'm actively trying to watch. You can click the little dingy ding dong bell and get notifications when I upload videos. Ryan Stolenwork pointed out that like cards with extort, Trinisphere also has a mana symbol in its reminder text. I'm sure there's actually some complicated way to to search for reminder text on Scryfall, but who needs that when you have a much more reliable database of cardboard conjurers in your YouTube comment section? Over on Reddit, EmptyStar12 brought up that they are always disappointed that I don't include Reddit comments in the comment section of my videos. I can't recall if I've ever done that before in the past, but I'm doing it right now. They also claim to drink over 20 glasses of milk a week. That's a whole lot of milk. Is that a lot of milk? It seems like a lot of milk. While having responded to a mere fraction of the excellent comments from last time, I must turn now to the primary goal of this video, uncovering the truth about one of the most scandalous cards in the history of Magic the Gathering. Farewell, Pontiff. Uh, yeah, let's click this button. Telepathic Spies. I love it. I don't know what this is, and I love it. Beautiful white border. What the hell? Telepathic Spies is a 3-mana common 2-2 human wizard creature reprinted in 7th edition, but originally printed in Urza's Destiny. Technically, we've featured a blue card on this channel before, with Spinal Embrace being featured in episode number 7, but that was a gold card. So this is the first entirely blue card we've had so far, except for Giant Tortoise, which we, which we already talked about, which is also a blue card that I totally forgot about while I was writing the script. Look at that beautiful swirling marble frame. Telepathic Spies is card number 47 in Urza's his destiny, following Sigil of Sleep, which shows a spiky-haired blue metathran about to tuck somebody in for a long dirt nap, and preceding Temporal Adept, in which noted pachyderm artist Heather Hudson depicts a mischievous mage in the distinctive checkered garb of the Talarian Academy. Urza's Destiny is 
the final set in Urza's block, following Urza's saga and Urza's legacy, also known by the codenames Armadillo, Guacamole, and Chimichanga. You might notice a troubling disconnect here between the first codename, which is a cute armored rodent native to the Americas, and the latter two, which are both delicious Mexican dishes. This isn't Wizards of the Coast endorsing the consumption of armadillos, which the Aztecs adorably referred to as turtle rabbits, but rather a strange confluence of usurpation, personal preference, and reformation. Urza's Saga was the only set not codenamed by the research and development team, as the branding team needed something to refer to the set by, and so they came up with Armadillo to go along with the existing habit of silly codenames. R&D was not super thrilled by this, and have made sure to have control over codenames ever since then. Guacamole was chosen next, because Mark Rosewater loves that word, despite not actually enjoying the mushy green avocado dip. And then Chimichanga was chosen to go along with the guacamole, and in doing so created a trend of having thematically matching codenames, which continued ever after forever and ever. I personally have a lot of trouble remembering the order of Urza's Saga, Legacy, and Destiny, because honestly, the names are all pretty much interchangeable. The set symbols don't really help either. Urza was the main character for the first seven-ish years of Magic Story, as the designated player insert Planeswalker, and he was big on Artifice, which is what the Gears, Hammer, and Erlenmeyer Flask featured on his sets presumably relate to. Some set symbols are abstract, and some show important cards from the set, but there don't appear to be any flasks in Urza's Destiny and definitely not any of the kind created by German chemist Richard August Carl Emil Erlenmeyer. The term German chemist, combined with the scary black and white photo, might start setting off alarm bells in your head. But don't worry, he died in 1909, so he was not involved in any nefarious Nazi nonsense. The closest thing I can find to a flask in Urza's destiny is this somewhat lopsided bottle being transported on the head of a disgruntled goblin in the artwork for Goblin Festival. So I think it's safe to assume this icon was simply selected for the vague scenes of scientific laboratories it helps to conjure. Urza was big on laboratories, and was always working on some kind of incredibly ambitious project to defy the laws of nature or common sense. There is a narrative rule I will often bring up with Magic the Gathering, which is that whenever Urza is involved, the normal rules just really do not apply. If we are told that it is impossible to break something, Urza will break it. If we are told that once broken, that same object is impossible to repair, then Urza would repair it. This is why Karn, who is a solid silver golem created by Urza as a time-traveling gopher, was allowed to become a planeswalker, despite the fact that we have been told many times that artificial beings cannot be planeswalkers. If you've ever taken a writing class, you might be wondering how any of the early stories about Urza were at all compelling, considering that he could easily overcome any obstacle and was essentially a godlike being. And long term, I do think that this would have limited the narrative tension they could create, but Urza was also kind of a jerk, and this really helped ground things. Urza was essentially kind of an anti hero, and the characters that many players relate with are actually likely the more innocent actors who orbited him, rather than Urza himself. Looking at Urza's block, we can see characters like Rafelos, the cheerful elf, Teferi, the rambunctious student, Karn, the glum time-traveling golem, Multani, the wise Maro sorcerer, and Baron and Rain, whose wedding vows were as strong as atomic bonds. All of these characters are beloved by Magic the Gathering players, in pretty uncomplicated terms. But while Urza is known for his creations, and his guile, and his rage, I don't know if I would say that people actually really like him as a character. Even the villainous Evancar de Vol is somehow more likable than the overbearing Urza. I mean, just, just look at this flavor text about him feeling underappreciated on his birthday. This is literally the bad guy in Urza's destiny. And since I thoroughly explained the title of Evancar in episode number four, you know the hideous weight that vaunted label bears. Also because Richard August Carl Emil Erlenmeyer is not known to the inhabitants of the myriad planets of Magic the Gathering, it's unknown what they would call this exact shape of scientific vessel. But given that Urza has some 23 different magic cards named after him, I wouldn't be surprised if it was called an Urza Meyer flask. The set Urza's Destiny released on June 7th, 1999, exactly 111 years after the birth of Clarence Harrison DeMar, also known as Mr. DeMarathon, who won the Boston Marathon seven times despite having my approximate very unimpressive physique and a serious heart murmur. To give you a sense of what life was like when Urza's Destiny was released in June of 1999, you might want to consider that the famous file sharing program and magic deck namesake, Napster, was also released that very same month, and that Apple computers released the first 
first iBook. So before rushing off to buy some booster packs of Urza's Destiny, you might want to start your download of the song Star Trekkin' by British novelty band The Firm, because it's going to take at least three hours to finish. Also on June 19th, 1999, 12 days after the release of Urza Meyer's Destiny, famous spookster Stephen King got hit by a car, Morgan Albertson style. Fortunately, he survived. But considering he wrote at least two completely unrelated stories about cars coming to life and trying to kill people, the incident is a little bit more than suspicious. Strangely enough, the man who hit Stephen King later died on Stephen King's birthday. And Stephen King bought the 1985 Dodge Caravan which struck him to prevent it from becoming possessed and coming after him again. That last part is only partially true, but it's more true than you would think. Also, I think I referenced Stephen King at some point in episode number three about the Scarecrow, but I'm not going to go back and look. Telepathic Spies, like all things which have multiple characteristics, shares its separate characteristics with only occasionally overlapping groups of other things. In this instance, many of those things happen to be other Magic the Gathering cards. A highly irksome and hard to ignore subgroup of these thin slices of wizard battle is creatures which have plural names, despite being singular. This is something that not only bothers me personally, but also something which is confirmed to bother the game's creators. Looking at another completely random magic creature, you'll notice that the name is singular, and that the art also depicts only an individual creature. The word elves, just like the word spies, implies that the card represents a group. Representing a group isn't itself an issue if it matches the flavor and art of the creature, like a swarm of gnats, or a swarm of rats, or a swarm of bureaucrats. But if we zoom in on the card Llanowar Elves using the latest in computer technology, we can discern pretty confidently that what we are seeing here is actually just one angry tattooed elf. After printing this iconic art only about 20 times, they finally got some new artwork for the Elves of Llanowar in 7th edition. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Before then immediately switching over to the art in 10th edition, which is more reminiscent of the iconic original art and once again, very singular. Modern Llanowar Elves are more consistently plural in depiction, including this token version of Llanowar Elves, which exists for very cool and complicated reasons. And it's worth mentioning that the much superior Findhorn Elves, which followed their Llanowar brethren, have always been accurately depicted in a multitude. After years of scandal and outrage surrounding the inconsistency in elf representation, Wizards of the Coast introduced Elvish Mystic, who is canonically singular in both name and appearance in every version. This might seem like an absurdly trivial detail, but being consistent in number and having a name which is not thematically linked to any specific wooded residence is legitimately why Wizards of the Coast chose to create another functionally identical elf card instead of just reprinting the several elves from Llanowar or the multiple much better in every way elves from Findhorn. Elvish Mystic isn't actually a mystic though. It's a druid. But honestly, that's a tangent too far flung for this presentation. Telepathic Spies falls into the same awkward grammatical pitfall as the first two out of these three tree-hugging mana dorks. We can go ahead and look at both card illustrations and utilize the same fancy enhancement technology we used earlier to determine that both of them show a singular, lone, unaccompanied spy. Although I guess technically neither illustration shows a single figure who is alone or unaccompanied. But in the field of espionage, you generally need somebody to spy on, and the figure recoiling in psychic agony and the traditionally handsome clean-shaven gentleman with a look of flabbergastment would seem to be the victims of espionage rather than the practitioners of this subversive act. Art is up for interpretation though, and our field of vision is locked, which prevents us from investigating further. So hypothetically there could be accomplices to these two central spies lurking in the mists or under their thick cloaks. But we usually talk about the artwork in the last third of these videos, so let's not pry too much into what these pair of artistic portrayals contains. It's possible being inappropriately plural is a hindrance to this card being reprinted more frequently, and these spies of the telepathic variety are in fact the only spy cards in the history of Magic the Gathering. Despite what this might seem to imply, there are actually quite a few other spies in the history of Magic the Gathering, although by other spies I mean a plurality of cards which show a singular spy, not multiple instances of singular cards referring to multiple spies. I'm pretty confident that nobody will find that confusing at all. Some of the other well-known spies from Magic the Gathering are Balistrad Spy, Balistrad. a vampire rogue who enables some very wild combo decks in Legacy, Modern, Vintage, Hopper, and formerly Pioneer.
Originally at this point in the video, I was gonna go through all of the spy cards, but with the exception of Orcish Spy, which I mentioned previously in my video about red 1-1 creatures for one mana, and the Goblin Spy, which I probably should have mentioned in my video about red 1-1 creatures for one mana. Honestly, it's not a very interesting list. The main point in going over them thoroughly is just to point out that with only a few exceptions, all spies are either printed as rogues or later updated to count as rogues. And while Telepathic Spies was updated to be a human, they were not made rogues, which I would argue is potentially an oversight. I'll talk more about that in a minute. While Telepathy certainly has a strong connection to wizards, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Both of the sneaky figures shown certainly appear fairly dastardly. I'll talk more about that in a minute. There are no wizard rogues in all of Magic the Gathering though, so perhaps committing these two different classes to one creature violates some kind of unspoken rule. We do have one example of a double-faced rogue creature which flips to become a wizard, as well as another flip card rogue creature which spins to become a wizard. I think you could describe what a flip card does as flipping, but I think it's almost inarguable that what a double face card does is more flippy than what a flip card does. Either way, neither of these are actually wizard rogues. Both wizards and rogues are very popular and highly supported tribes. Wizards are especially prominent, which I guess should be somewhat predictable given the people who make the game. And we can find the very first wizard, Prodigal Sorcerer, sometimes known by the name Tim, referencing Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Tim. All the way back in the original Magic set Alpha, Tim is noticeably a human, and is also now officially a human. Although the practice of specifying humans as a creature type didn't start until Mirrodin, which is why both versions of our telepathic spies are listed simply as being wizards. The rogue creature type wasn't introduced until Mirrodin either, and Nurok Spy, which we've already mentioned, or at least looked at, was actually the first rogue card ever printed. Despite many prior spies receiving errata, the humanification of Magic's varied, regular-looking people cards had a pretty sweeping and unifying effect, causing many dudes and dudettes, who were previously categorized as unrelated knights, dervishes, bird maidens, and Uncle Istvans, to suddenly have an overlapping characteristic. This created the plausibility of human tribal decks, which has come up at least a few times on this channel, and which will probably be at least briefly mentioned at some point later in this video. But for now, let's just acknowledge that the roguish wizards depicted on telepathic spies are believably human, even if they are conspicuously not rogues. Telepathy is a concept which is not rare within the sorceress settings of Magic the Gathering, with telepathy being depicted on cards like telepathy, although later being more associated with one very specific telepath whose guild pact snatching sneaker endorsement having prevalence had not yet come to overshadow the many other mind mages of Magic's planes when telepathic spies was introduced. The the concept of telepathy certainly relates to the ability of individuals to communicate through thoughts or some other extrasensory ability. While the nature of this communication doesn't have to be strictly psychic, things like sign language and semaphore do not count, which is kind of a shame because I would be really into a wizard who is able to mysteriously discern people's deepest secrets based upon the complicated pattern of flags that they were subconsciously waving from the deck of a battleship. Some other terms for telepathy include sixth sense, clairvoyance, psychometry, which is not a magic card name, despite being a pretty cool term, and extrasensory perception, or ESP, which is not a magic card name, and also not a very cool term. Mechanically, what telepathy represents in Magic the Gathering is actually very similar to what we see on spy cards. The cards which you hold in your hand, colloquially, and officially known as your hand, are often considered to represent the thoughts at the forefront of your spellcaster's mind. Effects that make you put these precious rectangles into your graveyard are often described as being being the seizure of thoughts, while the ability to simply observe what the contents of your squishy meat brain are is considered to be a form of mind reading or telepathy. To represent this, when our telepathic spies shows up on the battlefield, they give us a quick glance at our opponent's mind brain with their practiced mental infiltration. Seeing your opponent's hand gives you a valuable strategic advantage, although Gataxian Probe is a card which lets you see your opponent's hand for no mana, so the value of this strategic information could be called into question. Gataxian Probe is also super banned from pretty much every serious format that exists in the Gathering of Magic. In addition to being able to look at your opponent's hand, there is also some other text on Gataxian Probe though. This notorious free Phyrexian Luxie spell is basically just the card peak, except that you can cast it by paying life instead of mana. It's also very similar to Clairvoyance, which we already peeked at earlier. If we want to be extra thorough, we can get back to our espionological roots and cast Spy Network, which is another one mana blue instant, but instead of letting us draw a card, it simply lets us look at a player's hand, the top of their library, all of their face-down creatures, and the top of our own library. Telepathic Spies play 
basement in a set named after Urza is once again relevant here, as Urza has a history of looking at things. With both Urza's glasses and Urza's bobble giving you hand vision capabilities, the enchantment Seer's vision also represents Urza and grants telepathy levels of hand visibility. Unlike many cards named after Urza, this card isn't actually named after Urza, because for a while in Invasion Block, Urza pretended to be a blind seer, as seen on the card Blind Seer. I don't really understand why Urza decided to dress up like a blind seer, as seen on the card Blind Seer, but the fact that he is able to see all of your cards while literally wearing a blindfold reinforces my previous statement that Urza just doesn't play by the rules. If Urza can see without the use of his eyes, then why does he even need glasses? Throughout all of the examples of mechanical hand scrutiny which I've digitally displayed on your glowing display screens, you'll notice that all of them are either blue or black, and occasionally blue and black. While blue is all about reading minds to discern the contents of your opponent's hand, black almost always is looking at a hand in order to pluck something out of it. Technically you could cast Mind Warp for zero mana and look at an opponent's hand without actually making them discard anything. But over Overall, black cards don't really go looking at hands unless they're planning on taking something. White also just recently got a card that looks at opponent's hands, which is a startling new development. In addition to featuring a very dashing portrait of Hall of Famer and confirmed super nice person PVDDR, who we mentioned previously in the very romantic tortoise episode, Paolo's championship card is also a three mana human and can therefore be listed alongside the singular plural telepathic spies, separate and distinct from the more common peaks and probes and clairvoyantry as a creature which takes a hand gander when it enters the battlefield. When a creature has an ability attached to it, people will often refer to this as being a spell on a stick. As previously explained in episode number 9, unlike other spells, creatures have inherent value because they can do battle. So while telepathic spies might be Urza's glasses on a stick, the fact that it costs more and can't be activated multiple times is offset by the fact that it's got a physical endurance and crushing brute strength of a ferocious grizzly bear. This is one or more beefy, slender, tough, sneaky spies. Why did I, was I drunk when I wrote this? It really puts the stick in beat stick. And in a normal game of magic, your opponents have a mere 10 turns to deal with it. Or that's game over, man. Alongside PVDDR, who has a very complicated ability to temporarily tax a card from your opponent's hand, Telepathic Spies also has many other nosy creature comrades, ignoring the most thieving black variations and focusing on the cards that just collect information upon arrival. We've got Talus Explorer, Wu Scout, Wand Underguard Sentry, an ingenious thief who doesn't take a card from the hand it looks at even though its name strongly implies that it does. All of these creatures do their snooping when they enter the battlefield, and creatures with effects that trigger when they enter the battlefield are often used in conjuncture with cards that either multiply these enter the battlefield effects, or cards which can temporarily blink them out of existence so that they return and trigger again. Both of these strategies are very potent, with cards that gain life or draw cards or cause murder upon their grand entrance. But looking at somebody's hand twice in a row isn't really quite as appealing. Your opponents are likely to draw a new card every turn, based on the fact that they are required to do so because of the basic rules of the game. So flickering telepathic spies each turn will guarantee that you maintain up-to-date information, but this is still much less worthwhile compared to the first look. If you aren't planning on building a Panharmonicon combo deck to see how many times you can look at your opponent's hand consecutively, you might also be interested in some spy variants, like Dragon's Eye Servants, whose voyeurism occurs occurs when the card is unmorphed. If you had cast Spy Network earlier to look at your opponent's face down creatures, you might have seen that one coming. There's also Walker of Secret Ways, who looks at a player's hand when it deals combat damage to them, and Port Inspector, who looks at a defending player's hand when it doesn't deal combat damage to them. Lastly, there is an obscure, unknown, very esoteric card called Vendillion Click, which can look at a player's hand and then make them put a card from their hand on the bottom of their library, in exchange for letting them draw a new card. But this card is really much more like PVDDR's Elite Spellbinder, or a Black Hand Disruption spell, than a regular everyday mind-reading secret agent. So overall, I think with all of these varied blue creatures accounted for, we can visualize a pretty quaint little extended family for our telepathic spies. All of them are blue, mostly humans, and with a range of stats, costs, and capacities for aviation. It would almost seem like after a lot of unnecessary and unrelenting talk about telepathic spies' multiple characteristics, we've managed to narrow things down from the larger group of 21,132 cards, down to about 5 that share 99% of its mechanical DNA, and a few cousins and uncles that fall into similar but different roles. Among these blue, mostly human rectangles, there is actually a deep division though, and this lies in the 
hands, which they seek to scrutinize. As telepathic spies can only look at an opponent's hand, while a card like Ingenious Thief, or Urza's seemingly purely cosmetic spectacles, can look at any player's hand. This is a huge difference, and unfortunately dramatically impacts the playability of our devious telepathically trained spies. In Two-Headed Giant, a very fun and underappreciated format of Magic the Gathering, where games are played in teams of two, or in other team formats like Emperor or Arch Enemy, telepathic spies can still look at your opponent's hands, whether that is an opposing two-headed giant team or some other configuration of enemy players, but it is not capable of glancing at your teammate's hand. More importantly, when you cast telepathic spies in any game of Magic, regardless of format, you are not allowed to use its ability to look at your own hand. With a card like Gataxian Probe, which simply specifies player rather than opponent, you can choose your teammate or yourself, choosing to reassure yourself of your own hand's contents rather than gaining new information about your opponent's hand. Since you're legally allowed to look at your teammate's hand and your own hand at any time as much as you'd like, this isn't actually very useful, but it is still an option, and any seasoned spellslinger will tell you that the more choices you have, the better. One unifying aspect of the wide array of nuanced hand looking cards is the word target, and one way that players, including both teammates and opponents, like to insulate themselves from being targeted are cards like Leyline of Sanctity, or the older version of Leyline of Sanctity, which has Shroud, or the complicated old version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this creature version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this old creature version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this flying creature version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this flying green and white creature version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this other flying green and white version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this planeswalker version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this orb version of Leyline of Sanctity, or this orb version of Leyline of Sanctity which really hates curses. All of these cards give you hexproof or shroud, which means that their owner cannot be targeted by an opponent. If a spell doesn't have a valid target, it cannot be cast, which is the situation where casting Gitaxian Probe on yourself suddenly seems very worthwhile. The card Sorceress Sight from Portal is very similar to our other Peaky Probe Claire Voyagers, but crucially it has the telepathic spies restriction of not being able to function introspectively. So if your opponent has a Witchbane Orb out, you cannot even cast Sorceress Sight or any of the many many curses which you have sitting uselessly in your hand. Your hand which you sadly cannot look at using Sorceress Sight. Sorceress Sight does have some very neat reminder text though. While Telepathic Spies targets with its ability, this is a triggered ability that happens when it enters the battlefield, and choosing the target isn't part of casting the spell, so you can still deploy its jacked frame onto the war-torn battlefield to open up a can of grade A double agent punishment upon the pathetic, albeit more thoroughly hand inspecting 1-1 thieves of ingenious magic carpet conveyance. Not being able to find a target for Telepathic Spies causes its ability to dissipate like a mirage of a soap bubble in the dream of an ice sculpture drawn on an etch-a-sketch. This leaves Telepathic Spies as an unexciting but respectable 2-2 for 3 mana, which in the parlance of Magic the Gathering is often known as a Grey Ogre because of the famous card named Grey Ogre. This base level of function gives Telepathic Spies and all Something on a Stick cards a much lower bar for inclusion than something like Telepathy, especially in formats that actually care about lowly grunts, like Standard, Limited, Popper, and probably some other formats that I don't play or understand. Ursus block is old enough that you can't find convenient limited review articles, and the draft videos that do exist are very inconveniently broken up into two if not more segments due to the previous YouTube video length limits, and a desire to conceal the number of wins and losses, which all seems very antiquated now, but was my personal viewing experience for a long time. To try and discern any modicum of information about Telepathic Spy's desirability and draft, I find myself now reliving these memories, watching ancient draft videos recorded using the archaic and rudimentary looking old Magic the Gathering online interface. Urza's Destiny was never drafted by itself. As with the old block draft system, only the first set of a block would be drafted alone, before the second set was added with an un even 2 to 1 pack ratio, and then finally the last set would release, creating a balanced 1 to 1 to 1 drafting experience. So the only time you would ever open a pack of Urza's Destiny in draft was after opening a pack of Urza's Saga and Urza's Legacy. This means that the final set in any block would be opened much less than the previous two sets. This is probably why there aren't any long documents of famous magic players gushing about how amazing Telepathic Spies is. I was able to find some instances of Telepathic Spies showing up in Urza's Saga block draft videos or acid drafts as channel fireballs chris davis refers to it doing a little bit of a what we used to call acid block back in the day definitely enjoying some saga legacy destiny and whenever it shows up lo and behold there it is
with its original Thomas Boxa artwork. We've spoken about Thomas Boxa before when we discussed a certain gnat loving rat. So we'll give him a little bit of an abridged art examination here. But I would like to say that this piece falls really nicely in line with the basic stylistic hallmarks that we already talked about at greater length in that episode. The word inky always comes to my mind when I see Boxa's work, as his pieces have rich dark blacks and flowing viscous textures. The strong dichotomy here between ruddy brown and bright pale blue fits with the overarching color palette of his larger catalog, as well as his preference for utilizing two opposing colors to create stark visual contrast. This piece also contains a lot of the quick bold marker-like brushstrokes we talked about previously, which helps to define shape and give all of his work an exciting comic book feel. The visible anguish on the figure on the left makes it clear that they are the one probed and not the prober. And while their contorted limbs look a little bit silly, I quite enjoy the arrogant power stance of the face painted infiltrator. The composition here has a nice diagonal line to it, which adds a zesty dynamic feel, and the background is subdued and recedes in both directions, placing the action within the bending corner of a hallway, which is a neat device to make us feel a little bit claustrophobic and push our eyes towards the conflict at the center of the painting. The design of these characters with their absurd cloaks, armor, hair beads, and asymmetrical glove adornment is a classic example of the mage punk look, which really defined a lot of older magic sets. Magic the Gathering originates in the Seattle area in the 90s, so I guess it shouldn't be surprising that it has a uniquely grunge aesthetic. But other media like Mad Max and Spelljammer were probably more influential than Nirvana or Soundgarden. 7th edition came out a couple years after Urza's Destiny in 2001 and contained 350 white bordered reprints of classic beloved cards and also a few other cards like Telepathic Spies. This is where our second illustration comes from as every card reprinted in 7th edition had new artwork. The noticeably less grungy artwork here is contributed by Jim Nelson who has a total of 136 magic card illustrations under his belt, starting in Tempest Block but ending with Plane Chase in 2012. His pieces tend to have a restrained touch and great attention to detail. Some of the more prominent pieces in his magic portfolio include heavy hitters like Replenish, the original Putrefy, the original and less memed version of Ancient Grudge, and the somewhat uncharacteristically flat artwork for the iconic Iguana Toting Grim Lava Mancer. If you've ever cast a spell bomb or one of these neat Wisp cards from Shadowmore, or potentially the most notorious one mana black spell of all time, one with nothing, then you've come face to card face with some of Jim Nelson's work. My favorite of Jim's pieces might be Muck Drub, which is a weirdly quiet piece depicting a sad goop monkey trying to avoid confronting the innumerable horrors that surely await it outside of its serene tar puddle. Apparently Muck Drub is supposed to allude to the card Blood Pet, as most cards from Time Spiral Block were esoteric allusions to older cards. In a in similar fashion, Wizards of the Coast cleverly got Jim to illustrate the card Griffin Guide, which references his previous card Elephant Guide. Overall, his work is extensive, and he has many really beautiful pieces among his many rectangles, including this flippy rat rogue, rat wizard thing we mentioned earlier, as well as the card Scornful Egoist, which like telepathic spies, started out its life as a wizard before being reclassified as a human wizard, despite looking like one of those gooey hand toys you buy from a gumball machine, and also having flavor text which specifically mentions being human only in a past tense. I know that I suggest some amount of creature type revision in most of these episodes, but come on, this this guy is less human than Osmosis Jones. It's a great painting though. From what I can tell by looking at pictures on the internet with my eyeballs, all of Jim's illustrations for magic are done in acrylic. And while his rendition of telepathic spies looks very distinct from the original, I think that throughout his portfolio, there are actually a lot of other pieces that make more obvious the roots he shares with Thomas Boxa in comic art. The piece he delivered for the supernatural reconnaissance agent is much more subdued though, being heavily dominated by hazy blues. The foggy backdrop is achieved through the use of watercolor-like washes that mimic the foggy mental state of the handsome Dudley Do-Right looking surveillance target, while in the previous illustration the visible tendrils of mental manipulation act as a real focal point, here these wiggly mind noodles are somewhat secondary, allowing the glare of the long-faced wizard to convey the mesmerizing effects. I really like the look of the wizard here with his snidely whiplash mustache, his bizarre cranium shape, and his truly gigantic mitts, which hang limply from his vacuous sleeves. While the emotion on the face of the victim here is a little bit less dramatic, the Dutch tilt here really lends the work an unsettling feeling, as our brains struggle to find sure footing in a world that is depicted at an oblique angle. In the almost 10 years since Jim Nelson stopped making art for Magic the Gathering, he has gone on to do illustration for other properties, like Hearthstone, which I have previously disrespectfully 
and accurately described as being Neon Magic the Gathering. The copious amount of skill that Jim displays in his wide array of digital Hearthstone illustrations is impossible to ignore. And while it's easy to think of artists as being pigeonholed into one single look, an artist like Jim Nelson shows that this is quite untrue, and that an old dog can certainly learn new tricks, and portray a weird monkey in a banana hat just as proficiently as a weird monkey in a pool of muck. Like the other pairs of magic card art which we've had the privilege to analyze previously, this duo creates a really pleasant diptych when set beside one another, with a lot of similarities and conveniently opposing orientations. I think I prefer Box's piece overall, but I also think that his illustration puts more emphasis on the act than the characters, and this piece could easily be transferred to a spell like Mind Warp, while Nelson's more monochromatic piece really puts the singular spy front and center, despite not being in the front or being in the center. If I was going to include one of these versions in a deck, I would ultimately most likely go with the original, because let's be honest here, white borders are disgusting. But I do want to point out that the 7th edition set symbol, unlike some other core set symbols, is actually very elegant. I'd also like to point out that I'm never going to include this card in any of my decks because this card is terrible. When 7th edition came out and the spies had another chance to shine in that draft environment, they yet again seem to have missed the mark. In the 2002 draft guide written by Paul Sodasanti, he says the worst thing that you can possibly say about a card, which is nothing at all. And considering it was squeezed between fan favorite Stormcrow and the very similar card, Telepathy, we can see why maybe this card is largely overlooked. It's a bit odd to have Telepathy and Telepathic Spies in such close proximity, because controlling Telepathy functions transforms our scowling human wizard into that most gray of ogres. There is a similar but much more insidious reason why Telepathic Spies was also such a low priority effect when it was originally printed in Urza's Destiny. And this has more to do with the cards your opponent would be casting than anything in your own deck. One of the mechanical themes of Urza's Destiny was cards which allowed you to reveal cards in your hand. The most famous of these would be Metalworker, who allows you to reveal artifacts from your hand. But there are also similar creatures in every color, illustrated by Donato Giancola, as well as the scent cycle of strong smelling instants and sorceries. So having the ability to look at your opponent's hands isn't particularly valuable if your opponents are willingly showing you all of the cards in their hands. If you want to use your scrying glass to predict how many red cards are in your opponent's hand, that becomes a lot easier when they cast Scent of Cinder and reveal every single red card in their hand. Of course, if they have more than enough red cards in their hand to achieve the desired outcome, they could always keep one hidden. But these kind of big brain super plays are usually reserved for the realm of hypothetical online conjecture, rather than practical gameplay advice. The other glaring issue with our inappropriately pluralized spies is a more flavorful one. The flavor text on the original is very clever, while the flavor text on the reprint is a little bit more literal. Implying that the psychic powers allow a telepathic spy to retrieve information from hapless soap opera actors without needing to physically sneak into their base of operations is somewhat odd when both of these cards clearly depict the telepathic spies within gooey hand slapping distance of their targets. While the 7th edition victim seems more stupefied, the chimichanga version removes any conceivable subtlety from the telepathic extraction process and raises some crucial questions. While I personally have seen an average assortment of James Bond, Jason Bourne, and Mission Impossible films, as well as an above average amount of Get Smart, Spy Kids, and the very excellent film Top Secret, I've never actually read any Nancy Drew, and I have never met the Hardy Boys. It's clear that our modern pop culture is deeply enamored with the idea of spies, and all the sneaky, gadget-laden, and zoot-suit-wearing glamour that goes along with traveling around the world to acquire a manila envelope under false pretense. I think this is where the telepathy and the way it is portrayed on both copies of Telepathic Spies comes into conflict with the romantic notion of spying itself. Spies are essentially con artists whose goal is to acquire information rather than money or prepaid target gift cards. But conning somebody revolves around using your charm and your wit to convince them to give you access without utilizing a brute force. And breaking into somebody's mind isn't really any different than breaking somebody's nose. If they can see you glaring at them with clenched fists and fully exposed thought tentacles, neither of our single multiple spies is really trying to hide in the shadows here, or disguise themselves, or communicate with their fellow operatives via hidden shoe phone. These are telepathic muggings, and the imposing wizards who are committing these acts of brazen brain evasion couldn't even be bothered to use a spyglass or find a more discreet vantage point. So while I suggested earlier that it was odd that telepathic spies lacks the rogue creature type, maybe 
that's actually totally acceptable, because these human wizards are more Poindexter than Pinkerton, and I honestly don't think they could sneak their way out of a brown paper bag. Scornful Egotist creature type, I'm not budging on though. I've seen humans, and that is not a human. So after all is said and done, while I do always try and be charitable with my reviews, it seems like other than having some nice artwork, Telepathic Spies might really be an abject failure. The card is inappropriately pluralized, inappropriately labeled as being engaged in anything resembling espionage, strangely superfluous in both sets where it was printed. And as far as I can tell, nobody has ever cast this card in any format, ever. Every card I talk about on this channel is somewhat overlooked, but it's almost as if Telepathic Spies never even existed at all. It came and it went, and nobody remembers it, like a half-forgotten dream, like a firefly against a star-filled sky, like an innocuous object hidden in a well-photographed menagerie of eclectic items. Nothing more than a single boring card disappearing into an endless sea of equally boring cards. And honestly, despite lacking the covert tactics of more traditional spies, this ability to easily fade from memory is perhaps the best representation of what a telepathic spy would hope to achieve. Wow, that, uh, that Patreon section is really getting super out of hand. Anyways, that is the end of episode number 14. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm gonna try and make this outro section a little bit shorter than normal because I'm tired. And honestly, I just don't have that much time. Some of my longtime viewers might be aware of a downward trend in the frequency with which I release these videos. For the first seven weeks of this channel's existence, I released a brand new video every single week, which honestly, was insane. I, I literally physically don't actually know how I managed to do that. After this honeymoon period, I consciously switched over to a bi-weekly schedule, which I thought would be more sustainable. And if I didn't have a big boy job, that might be the case. But I have a big boy job. So you might have noticed that I've gradually shifted over to a once a month release schedule. I know that all 447 of you are eagerly awaiting every new video I release. And I feel bad to make you wait. But unfortunately, in addition to my job, I'm also gonna have to move soon. And my life has gotten kind of complicated in general. As as the pandemic has started to wind down and things have started to open up in my part of the world, I've actually had the opportunity to do in real life things. And as much as I love sitting behind a computer for literally 24 hours a day, going outside is kind of neato. And you know what happens when you go outside? Sometimes you end up going back inside after going outside. And once you've gone back inside, you play Magic the Gathering with living, breathing human beings. And ultimately the fact that I couldn't play Magic is what motivated me to make this silly YouTube channel. And even though I started all of this just to entertain myself in the short term, I will say that I feel like I've really gotten a knack for it. I appreciate all the wonderful individuals who watch this channel and leave me fantastic comments down below in the comment section. And I hope you appreciate the fact that I still make this worthless trash. And I hope you'll join me next time on Air.